Dear gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity where we can learn more about what it truly is to have pure entertainment. Lord, I ask that you will anoint my lips and that my words will not be my own but yours, and that you will open our hearts to the understanding of your word and understanding that you want the best for us, oh Lord. And Lord, may the people that are here, may you continue to work in their lives and help us, Lord, to become more like Jesus, not only in words as Christians, but rather doers of your word. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you're entertaining. I can switch the presentation because I know that I'll have more um, to present in this aspect than I did earlier. But anyway, I want to start off with just uh, a testimony. I usually start off with my testimony and how God has changed and converted my life. So during high school and um, college years, I was addicted to romantic novels and watching movies and listening to music. I was so addicted to it that in my nursing nursing school, I would read I would read my nursing book, but actually I wasn't reading my nursing book because right there in my nursing book there's you know romantic novels, pocket books, and my friend and I would love reading all these romantic novels. I would stay up even at three o'clock in the morning to read these books, and my mom was like, "Are you studying?" And I'm like. Um, no, I'm not studying and reading my, my novels. And she was just really angry because, and frustrated because instead of studying, you know, for school, I was doing other things. And actually, it's only about three years ago, three or four years ago, that God removed this desire from my life. And um, I also stopped, um, I also love watching television. I can watch TV for about 12 hours straight. Movies after movies after movies after movies. And I love romantic and scary movies. So I indulge myself in that, watching these movies, thinking that, you know, it's not going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt my character and my personality. And, you know, when we have that kind of thinking, we're actually fooling ourselves. When we say, we say we're Christians, yet we watch these kinds of movies, right? Scary movies or whatever kind of movies that I was, that people were into, right? I, would, I love going to theaters, you know, I would go there and my friends and I would do theater hopping. That means we would watch, we would pay for one movie, but we would hop in all these different kinds of theaters. What you guys are doing now, you're hopping to different sessions, that's what we are doing. We're hopping to different movie session and see what we can get. And what we wanted to watch is that all these romantic things, we wanted to fall in love, you know, get married, happily ever after, all these Hollywood um, lovesick sentimentalism. And so, it was actually, when GYC 2008, the first GYC that I went to, and that's when I realized that you can't be half of the world and half of Satan and still call yourself a Christian. There's no such thing. It's either you're with God or you're not. Right? Isn't that true? Amen. Okay. So when I realized that, God has put that burden in my heart. And I have a whole collection of CDs and DVDs because my dad, also this includes music, my dad loves the Beatles. Beatles, Bee Gees, ACDC, all these rock and roll music. I just want to let you know, I used to be a drummer. I played the drums. My brother and I were in a band. Okay, we played drums. And I told myself, I'll never play drums at church. But I did. I played drums on the side of church. So I'll tell you more about, uh, more details in regards to that. But I used to play these rock and roll music. I would listen to six days. I would listen to worldly rock and roll music. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. So therefore, I should listen to Christian music, right? That was the thinking. And so, um, in 2008, one of the sermons was like, if you really have 
committed and surrendered your life to Jesus, you would give up all those things. You would put Jesus first and foremost in your life. So in 2009, January 2009, I got all the CDs, all the DVDs, and I got a hammer. I didn't just want to throw them away because I was thinking, someone else might get this and they might watch it. And when I got that hammer, I was like hammering away. And my dad was like, what is going on upstairs? And I was like hammering all the DVDs and the CDs. And, and I was really happy doing it. I was like so glad. I was like, wow, it, didn't, it doesn't really feel bad. So I was like hammering away, hammering. And I destroyed all of them. I even dismantled. I have a, I treated my drum set, my like acoustic drum set to electrical drum set. So the electrical drum set was worth about thousand dollars, and my CDs and DVDs was worth about you know five hundred dollars worth, and most of them weren't even mine; they were my dad's. And so I destroyed all of them, and I it really was a burden lifted off because although yes I wasted a lot of money, and my parents, well my mom. And my brother and my uncle, they didn't understand why I was doing this. I was like, why didn't you just, you know, donate it or so sell it so you can give the money to mission? Well, what is that? What good does that do, right? Okay, you're giving the money to mission, but the person that you're selling those DVDs and movies or CDs to, that person can be drawn further away from Christ because of what you did. Right? Yes, it's a good act that you're giving it to mission the money, but really it's not leading people to Jesus. When we listen to worldly and when we read books that are of the world and when we watch movies that are of the world, we're not drawing people to Jesus. We're not drawing ourselves closer to Jesus. We're becoming further and further away from Christ. And so at last, I was free of um, Satan's temptations. And, excuse me. <coughs> and so, now that I've become closer and closer to Jesus, and when he removed the desire and passion of watching movies and DVDs, and, um, reading all these books. I wanted to serve him <clears throat> more diligently. I, I wanted to give my life to him. And so, I know that you guys are here. I don't know your relationship with Jesus. I don't know your spiritual life, but God knows. Jesus always tried to make others happy. He was so kind and gentle. 
that the rabbis hoped to make him do as they did. They urged him to obey their rules, and he would ask what the Bible taught. Whatever the scripture said, he told them he would do. The rabbis took his answers as disobedience. They knew that their rules were contrary to the Bible, and yet they were angry with Jesus for refusing to obey him. So if Jesus read the scriptures, how much more should we read the scriptures? Much more. And in my life, I just started reading the Bible consistently when I finished nursing school. Okay? So that was just four years ago that I was consistently reading the Bible. But what does the Bible say? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Psalms 100, 19, 14 through 16. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all the riches, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. God doesn't want us to forget his word. You have Psalms 119, 65 through 67. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. How many of you here read God's word daily? Anybody? You know, it's so important. Even in these last days, how many of you here, you know, read Spirit of Prophecy? Okay. Um, thank you for being honest. It's, it, you know, it's so important. When I was in high school, I didn't know, I knew about Sister Light, but I really didn't know about all her books. I didn't. And it was just recently that I learned about, you know, Spirit of Prophecy. And, and, you know, one example in particular, one of the great men and women in the Bible read God's word diligently. And, and this one is Ezra. He's one of the major prophets. He said in Ezra 7 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances to Israel. How did he prepare his heart? And how can we prepare our hearts before God? You know, first he had to empty himself of self daily. When, when we really want God to be the first and foremost in our lives, and we really want to dedicate our life for his service, we have to empty ourselves of self. Second, we have to confess and repent of our sins. You know, when we're building a relationship with Jesus, we don't want any known sin in our lives. Confess. It says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Thirdly, fervent prayer and supplication. When we pray, sin, when we pray sincerely and ask God for guidance, He will give it to us. Amen? Amen. And it says here, number four, He asks for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God said, you don't ask as much, that's why I don't give as much. When we ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, He will provide. Third, fifth, He studied the law and the statutes of God. It's just, I want to emphasize this so much, because Satan is out there wanting to attack us. He wants to get control of our minds. He wants us to um, get swayed by the things of this world. Six, he obeyed and followed God's commandments. So is it really important to read and to know God's word? Think about it this way. If we don't have rules and regulations, even if we do have, here in the Philippines, what I notice is that it says, don't throw trash. And then right there is there's trash. 
there's murders. And that's what's happening in this world is that we've um, made God's law obsolete. We, we don't, you know, we take His law for granted. And when we don't seek and study His word, we're just pretty much, we're saying that we're Christians and we're not following, we're not doing what He wants us to do. And how can we seek God? If he said in Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will see me and find me when you search for me with all of your hearts. Are we searching for the Lord with all of our hearts? Sister Wright says in his Testimonies, Volume 7, page 64, Young men and young women, read the literature that will give you true knowledge and that will be a help to the entire family. Stay firmly. I will not spend precious moments in reading that which will be of no profit to me and which will only unfit me to be of service to others. I will devote my time and my thoughts to acquire a fitness for God's service. I will close my eyes to frivolous and sinful things. My ears are the Lord's, and I will not listen to subtle reasoning of the enemy. My voice shall not in any way be subject to a will that is not under the influence of the Spirit of God. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and every power of my being shall be consecrated to worthy pursuits. We must purpose and determine in our hearts that we're not going to defile ourselves. Daniel, they were in Babylon, they were captives of Babylon. Yet they, they, they purpose in their hearts that they're not going to defile themselves. They study the scriptures. And so, you know, these are the, the characters in the Bible, these are the people that we should emulate and follow. Because we are not wrestling, Ephesians 6 12, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual force of wickedness in heavenly places. Do you believe that there's a great controversy? There is a great controversy. And Satan is wanting to win. But he has already lost the battle. God won the war. And uh, to every problem, there is a solution. It says, therefore, Ephesians 6, 13 through 18, therefore take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always in all the prayer and supplication of the Spirit. So God wants us. He doesn't want us to go to the battle empty-handed. He's saying, take on, you know, the righteousness. Thank you. Take on the breastplate of righteousness of Jesus Christ and put on the whole armor of God. We want to feed our minds with heavenly things. That is very, very important. Education, excuse me, Troy, message of, messages to young people, page 271 says, education is but a preparation of the physical, intellectual, and spiritual powers for the best performance of all the duties of life. The mind should be disciplined, that all its powers will be symmetrically developed. Many youth are eager for books, the desire to read everything that they can obtain. Uh, with they let them take heed what they read as well as what they hear. I have been instructed that they are in the greatest danger of being corrupted by the improper reading. Satan has a thousand ways of unsettling the minds of you. They cannot safely be off guard for a moment. They must be set watch upon their minds that they may not be allured by the enemy's temptation. Isn't it true nowadays, you know, there's many movies and books that are coming out like Harry Potter or what, what's the other one? The Vampire thing? And all these things are just going against the Bible. I don't know if you guys um, I don't, I've never read the Harry Potter one or the Vampire thing but looking at it is very demonic. And when you read it, are you still wanting to read the Bible after reading those books? Do you still 
still have the desire of reading the Bible after reading those books? When I read the romantic novels and those the watch those movies, I had no desire of reading the Bible. It was boring. You know? This was very boring to me. When I was starting to read Genesis, I was like, oh my goodness, this is boring. And then in the book of, I think, Leviticus or it was just really boring to me. It, it didn't appeal to me. Why? Because I was already polluting my mind with watching these movies that are exciting. You know, everything in the movies is, you know, everything clicks, everything is, you know, 15 seconds of this and 15 seconds of this commercial. Our, our minds, when we watch television, our minds are being dulled are being dumped, actually, when we watch television. It's better not to watch television than watch at least, you know, 15 minutes of television. Because our minds are not even thinking. It's not working. The television, what it does is just feeding, feeding, feeding. And you're not articulating anything. You're not being able to think. All these are just seeing distractions. And it can never fill the emptiness that we are seeking for. What does Sister White say in Effects of Fiction? It says in Science of the Times, number 10, 1881, the mind is ruined, which is allowed to be absorbed in storytelling. The imagination becomes deceased, sentimentalism takes possession of the mind, and there is a vague unrest, a strange appetite for unwholesome mental food, which is constantly unbalanced by novel reading, which results in air castle building, and lost six sentimentalism. But the, these very youth who profess to be Christians gratify the desire of the carnal heart in following their own inclinations and God given probationary time. Granted them to become acquainted with the precious truths of the Bible is devoted to the reading of fictitious tales. This habit, once formed, is difficult to overcome, but it can be done. It must be done by all our candidates for the heavenly world. We are all God's children. If we say we're a follower of Jesus Christ, then we are all God's children. And since it's here that we can overcome, you know, we can overcome that desire of reading that poppy book. We can't disregard those filthy movies or those music that is, you know, just deafening. Sometimes, you know, this... This pure entertainment not only is about music and, and movies, you know, sometimes in websites that we go to, pornography, you know, these things that we lust after. Well, that, you know, we're thinking, well, I'm not really committing adultery. When you're watching pornography or any kinds of, you know, sexual uh, movies, that is committing adultery. You're lusting after someone, you know, when you're watching those kinds of movies. And so, for me, it, it really was by God's grace that I was able to remove that desire and passion for that. It says in Messages to Young People, page 273, it will not strengthen your spirituality, but will introduce into the mind sentiments that pervert the imagination, causing you to think less of Jesus and to dwell less upon his precious lessons. Keep the mind free from everything that will lead it in a wrong direction. Do not encumber with trashy stories, which imply no strength in the mental powers. The thoughts are the same character as the food provided for the mind. I used to watch series of soap operas. I don't know if you guys used to watch them, but I used to watch a lot of them in the States. I kept watching them and watching them, and um, to the point that instead of studying, I would watch soap operas. I was just addicted to them. Or what's the next one? You know, the Talisay of the Marimar or whatever kind of, you know, what's the other one? Um, um, I'll do or something like that. But when I was here in the Philippines, I, it's um, one of those series that we watch as friends. And we would, I, I, used, I love watching Friends. I don't know if you guys watch Friends, but I love watching Friends. I love watching the Hope and Group and these kinds of shows. And uh, in reality TV shows too, I love watching. But the thing is, the more I watch them, the more I want to become like them, the more I want to act like them. You know, Satan is wanting us to act like him. The characters that they portray, it doesn't show the 
character of Jesus, and he shows the character of the enemy. And so, Jesus promised us, these things that I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. When we watch those things, do we have peace in our hearts? When I watch scary movies, I would sleep right next to my mom, because I was just scared. I'm like, mom, can you sleep?
Bible became more and more interesting. But we have to make that choice. Are we willing to put God first? Or are we willing to put ourselves first? And in regards to music, I love playing the drums. I love playing the drums. To a point that we lived in an apartment and I loved it, but at the same time, when I'm angry, I would go into my drum set and I would just bang, 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 bang. You know, and my neighbors, they were just like really angry with us because I was so loud. And but the thing is, I I was polluting my my mind with different kinds of music. I wasn't even paying attention to the lyrics. The rhythm, the rhythm of the music was taking me. I wanted to dance. I wanted to do all kinds of things when I listen to worldly music. And um, we might not think that listening to worldly music doesn't affect our mind, but actually these kinds of music affect our mind, our way of thinking. And I thought, who cares, right? Who cares what I listen to? But actually psychologists, doctors, musicians, and even you know, people have said that music is a language of the soul. And it steers up our feelings, our emotions. And sometimes, you know, we feel like when we listen to nice romantic music, we, we feel like we're in love. You know in the movies, if you mute the music, you're not going to feel any kind of emotion. But that's why they put those music in there, because you, when that guy is running after the girl, and like, like, oh, you know, you want to, you're just so in love. But if you mute that music, a guy running after a girl. But I just want to let you know the effects of music and how we really need to be careful in what music we listen to. I, I thought, who cares what music I listen to? As long as I go by my feelings, I go by my emotions. I don't care what kind of music I listen to. But think about it this way. There's three parts to music. Do you know what they are? Three parts to music. There's melody, harmony, harmony and, rhythm. and rhythm. Okay? There's there's a trinity, right? There's a Godhead. And who's the Godhead? Got the Father, got the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And do you know how Satan has twisted music? Lucifer, right? He was a, you know the best, one of the best angels. Actually, he was the best angel. And when Satan, he twisted the music, what he put first was rhythm, and then harmony, and then melody. He wants you to go with the groove, go with the mood, you know. He doesn't want you to listen to the melody. He doesn't want you to listen to harmony. He wants you to, to go with your emotions and your feelings. And so, when we think about it, when we think of the lyrics, of some of the music we listen to. One of the music I thought that I was, I, I love one of the bands before, Red Hot Chili Peppers, I don't know if you know them. But there's one music that talks about, and I memorize the, the music because I listen to it very a lot. So one of them talks about like, you know, blasphemy in the name of Jesus. And I was, you know, I thought, I was just repeating those lyrics. I thought it didn't mean anything. But I was blaspheming the name of Jesus with those lyrics. And so, once, do you know the story in the Bible where um, Moses left, right? He was in Mount Sinai and he got the Ten Commandments. What did the people of Israel do when Moses was gone? 40 days, 40 nights. Huh? Yeah, right? The golden calf. That's what they did. They thought, but, you know, in Exodus 32, 17 to 19, Moses had just received the written law of God from Mount Sinai. And it says that, and let me read that to you guys. Exodus chapter 32. I'm not able to read that. Exodus 
people thought that Moses had left them and they didn't have, you know, they didn't have the, a leader anymore. So what they did is that they had some um, some jewelry they wanted to make, a golden cap and, and worship. They forgot that Jesus, that God has taken them out of, from the Egyptians captivity and brought them there to Mount Sinai to receive this law. But instead of seeking God, they, you know, started dancing and, and playing these kinds of music. And they did all kinds of abomination in the sight of God. All kinds of abomination. And to the point that um, Moses was really angry that he threw that tablet of law to them. And so here we see with the music that we listen to, we get carried away by our feelings, by our emotions. But sometimes we tend to forget. Are we going by, by, by God's word or are we going by our own feelings? Some Christian contemporary music now, they have some bells and, and some you know, different kinds of rhythm. And you think, well, it's Christian, you know. But when you listen to the lyrics, it doesn't, some, it doesn't even address God. Sometimes it when I was listening to some of the music, it doesn't even address God as God. It's something else. And I want to tell you a story. One time, my pastor was telling me, in one church, it was a Christian church, and I think it was an Adventist church as well, they were playing these kinds of music, there was drums, and they were playing all these kinds of music, worldly, uh, it wasn't worldly, it was Christian music, but when they were playing music, one of the people from the church, I don't know, they didn't know who it was, she started going up the stage and started dancing up on the stage during church service. And this person was not Christian. And she thought she was just in a club. And she started dancing inside the church. And the people were shocked. Why would you be shocked, right? If you're playing those kinds of music and people from the world are coming in, they're really not going to see a difference for who you're worshiping. They think you're just in a club and partying. And so when I heard this story, I was like really shocked. And people had to re rewind and rechange the way they think. And um, I want to let you know, in depression, the way out, I, there was a program in our church in, the in regards to depression, recovery, recovery from depression. And they said that a study of 121 Midwestern high school students' music preference were heavy metal music. They had compared it with 35% of the girls who preferred other types of music. Nearly 50% of the boys who preferred heavy metal had considered suicide, compared with 50% of the boys who listened to non metal music. There's more chances of young people committing suicide. Because what's the music nowadays? It's about death, it's about killing, it's about blood, it's about, you know, hurting yourself, being lonely, being alone, emo, that's like another term that they use. Oh, I'm, I'm emo, I'm emotional. And it, those music really will depress you. And so God created music for us to give glory to Him, for us to uplift Him. But what Satan did is he's using it to destroy each and every one of us. Because we have a choice. We always have a choice. But God cannot force us to choose, right? One of the things that God can do is He can't force us. He can't force you to choose what kind of music you're listening to. But each and every one of us have a choice. And, um, Aristotle said, if one listens to the wrong kind of music, he will become a wrong kind of person. Conversely, if one listens to the right kind of music, he will become the right kind of person. Do you believe in this? Do you believe this? I believe it. It's true. So what does music in the brain have to do with anything? Here in the Depression, the way out, um, page 209, Music appears to have both general and specific brain effects. Listening to music appears to favorably balance the frontal lobe, functioning depression. By actual EEG measurement, music decreases over dominant right frontal lobe activity in chronically depressed individuals. However, medical research also raises serious concerns.
which is your limbic system, your emotional um, system, or there's types of music that goes straight to your frontal lobe and makes you think. It clears your mind. It says from from there, so from there, some kinds of music tend to produce a frontal lobe response that influences the will, moral worth, and reasoning power. Other kinds of music will evoke very little, if any frontal lobe response, but the, but will produce a large emotional response with very little logical or moral interpretation. Thus, depending on the type of music, its net influence can be either beneficial or detrimental, depending on whether it dominantly stimulates the frontal lobe or the lower emotional centers. Music therapists tell us certain types of music, such as a rock with its syncopated rhythm. You know that beat? My drum teacher said, you gotta go, you gotta hit the snare with the second and fourth beat. So you go one and two and three and four and one and two. So at the two and the four, that's when you hit the beat. And when we, that's the syncopated beat. Two and four. And so when we hear that syncopated beat, our brain just you know, kind of numbs. It becomes numb. And our frontal lobe, it kind of sleeps and it doesn't make us think of what kind of music we're listening to, the lyrics that we're listening to. So they did a test. In, um, they did a test on mice. One, they did an eight-week study test. One mouse listened to rock and roll music. One mouse listened to classical music. And then the other mouse listened to, uh, they didn't listen, the other mouse didn't listen to any kind of music. And at the beginning of the study, all the mice went through a standard maze test, which was searching for food. All of them at the beginning performed equally well. But by the end of the eight weeks, the second and third group learned how to get their food, the cheese. But the first group, which was the first group, the one that listened to the rock and roll music, right? The first group couldn't find the, the way to get the cheese. It was having difficulty. In other words, the brain function of that, ma that mouse was having difficulty. If we listen, for example, the, this depression recovery class that I took is for those people that are really wanting to get away from the depression aspect. They were listening to heavy kinds of metal, which their emotions are being, you know, being here, feeling down and depressed. And so when when the doctor suggested that you listen to classical music, listen, listen to classical music without having that syncopated beat, because rock and roll music and have, have any kind of music, hip-hop, hip-hop, whatever, they have the syncopated beat. And when you listen to that syncopated beat, your brain doesn't think, your frontal lobe doesn't think. But when you listen to classical music, you might think it's boring, you know, there's no rhythm to it. But when we listen to those classical music, our minds are actually open. And our minds are actually thinking. And studies, there are studies that they've done, and it really does help. In the depression recovery class that I went to, they gave us all classical music so that we can listen to them. And so, the rock, the rock group, which is the mice that was listening to that rock music, he had permanent brain damage. And it, even after eight weeks of that um, music that he was listening, they stopped, um, they stopped them from listening to um, the rock and roll music, the mouse. But even that, it still had a detrimental effect on that, on that mouse's brain. And so the researchers concluded that music, rhythm's not harmonic, or doesn't have a melodic structure, cause the memory and, and cause memory and learning problems. They theorize that certain musical rhythms can enhance body functions, while other rhythms tend to clash with or disrupt internal rhythms. When natural rhythms are disrupted, just detrimental effects result, including permanent learning difficulties. If such results to carry over the humans, we would expect deleterious effects on moral values, learning and reasoning power. Furthermore, furthermore, because of the connections between frontal lobe impairments and depression, we might also anticipate a connection between rock music.
anxiety and depression. So this study is done by non-Christians, okay? I want to make that clear. This study is done by non-Christians. And they see the effects, because in America, there's a lot of people there that are depressed. There's a lot of, we have a psych unit, you know? I don't know about you guys, but they listen to a lot of heavy rock music there as well in America. And so, you know, there's, there's music that we can listen to that will enhance our capability of learning, of wanting to study. And for me, I realized that when I started listening to classical music, to Christian music, none of the music that has that syncopated beat, I was able to think more, I was at peace, and I didn't really, you know, went by my emotions and my feelings. I made, I was able to make a clear-cut decision. And Sister White writes about music. She said, messages to young people in 293. Music was made to serve a holy purpose, to lift the thoughts to that which is pure, noble and elevating, and to awaken in the soul devotion and gratitude to God. What a contrast between the ancient custom and the uses to which music is now too often devoted. How many employed this gift to exalt self instead of using it to glorify God? There's a wrong choice of music. Testimony page 106. It says, angels are hovering Angels are hovering around yonder dwelling. The young are there, assembled. There is the sound of vocal and instrumental music. Christians are gathered there, but what is it that we hear? It is a song of frivolous ditty. Fit for the dance hall. Behold the pure angels gather their light, closer around them, and the darkness envelopes those in that dwelling. Sadness is upon their countenances. Behold, they are weeping. The angels are weeping. Music has occupied the hours which should have been devoted to prayer. Music is the idol which many profess Sabbath keeping Christian worship. We sometimes worship more of the music than we worship God. Satan has no objection to music. If he can make that a channel through which to gain access to the mind, minds of the youth, anything will suit his purpose that will divert the mind from God and engage the time which should be devoted to his service. He works with the means which will exert the strongest influence to hold the largest numbers in pleasing infatuation while they are paralyzed by his power. When turned to good account, music is a depressing, but it is often made one of Satan's most attractive agencies to ensnare souls. When abused, it leads the unconsecrated to pride, vanity, and folly when allowed to take place of devotion and prayer. It is a terrible curse. I want to let you know, when I was listening to one of the sermons in regards to music, Sonic Warfare, Pastor Ira Myers, I don't know if you've heard of his sermon, but when I listened to his sermon, he said that in, in Africa, the drum beat, the syncopated beat, they have this beat to bring about the dead people. In other words, they're trying to call, you know, their, you know, ancestors. And when one of the, one story I heard is that one of the people from Africa came to America and they heard that same syncopated beat. And the, the, the guy said, hey, that's the same beat that we play when we try to want to get that spiritism, you know, spiritism, trying to get the, the dead guy to come and um, that's what we do, that kind of thing. So in other words, it's the same thing. The music that I was playing, the drum beats, the, the syncopated beat that I was playing and the music that I was listening to was the same type of music that people um, in the tribes of Africa are using to call about the dead. And that is a scary, scary thing. It says here, music, a power for good. Testimonies, volume 4, page 71. Music can be made a great power for good. Yet we do not make the most of the branch of worship. Music should have beauty, pathos, 
was in power. Let the voices be lifted in songs of praise and devotion. Call to your aim with practical instrumental music, and let the glorious harmony ascend to God, an acceptable offering. Don't allow Satan to control your mind. Don't allow Satan to control your mind. We all have freedom of choice, freedom to choose good and to choose bad. And I urge each and every one of you to choose wisely in the kinds of music that you listen to. Because you might not think it's harmful, but it's very detrimental to your spiritual life. Very detrimental. And, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to judge you or anything, but for me, it really made an impact in my life. And when I was, when God, you know, took those desires away from me, it was really a great blessing. So pray about it. Pray, really pray and ask God. We can't do it on our own, for sure. We cannot do it on our own. And people always ask me at church because, not always ask me, but when we talk about controversies about music, because there's some drums, you know, in, in, in our Adventist churches, there's some drums, drum playing, right? You've heard drum playing in our Adventist church. And so when they, when they try to reason, they said, well, you know, David danced, he danced naked. Well, also, David had many concubines, right? Does that mean we're going to follow what David did wrong? Did God put them the dancing that they did naked? No. Those are just, you know, those stories of um, those people and characters in the Bible are for us to learn lessons from. Because when we try to reason, well, yeah, we can have this kind of music because, well, they did it, you know. That doesn't mean it, it's right. That doesn't mean it's right. Just because David did that, that doesn't mean that, you know, God honored what he did. And this is what David said. Psalms 92. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoicing. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Who are the true worshipers of God? You know? You don't know. Um, aren't there, the true worshipers of God are the angels, right? And how did they worship the Lord? Did they worship the Lord dancing and, and, and shouting and, you know, did they worship God that way? No. They worship God in reverence. They even veil their faces. And how do we worship God? I mean, yes, we have six days, right? Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But that doesn't mean that in those six days, that we're going to forget God, and then on the seventh, that's when we'll remember Him. No. God wants us to remember Him daily. And God wants us to represent Him correctly, purely, in purity. And so, when the angels worship God, it was because they were humble. They were praising God for what God has done, for God being able to create them. And for us, you know, He has done so much for us. And these small things, uh, maybe it might not be small for you. Maybe reading pocket books or watching those movies, maybe it's something that those addiction that you're, you know, you're struggling with. But when we ask God, when we, when we pray, God, Lord, remove this desire. Remove this desire and this passion of listening to these kinds of worldly music. Remove it from my heart. And if we're willing, you know, we have if we have those things in our in our in our house, if we have those kinds of music or whatever, if the Lord convicts you to get rid of them, then get rid of them. Because Satan will still be in your house if you have things that belong to him. Right? Those kinds of worldly movies and music and books, those things belong to Satan. So he has access. So Jesus will send his angels. But if Satan has access to you because you have those kinds of materials, then, you know, there's still going to be trials. Of course, there's still going to be tribulations, yes. 
but you are more prone to it when you allow the enemy to enter your life. And those kinds of books and music, these entertainment, you know, it's really not worth it. Because it's your eternal salvation. Right? Are you willing to sacrifice your salvation for those kinds of things? I don't. I don't want to. And, and I just ask that you just pray earnestly about it. If you guys are struggling. And I know that God has given me that freedom, that, that, that burden. He has freed me from that burden. And if He can do it for me, He can do it for each and every one of um, And so, I don't know if this presentation was able to help you um, in regards to your struggles. I sure hope it did, by God's grace. And if you do have questions, um, please let me know. But I think we'll end it at, is it time to end it now? Not yet. What time is it? It's been an hour. 517. 517. So if you want, you can ask questions now. And we can, okay. How please. about the movies that are uh, stories of, or true stories of people who are famous or who uh, like, gave some influence to the world. Oh, like, um, what do you call that, documentaries? Yeah. I mean, those, I don't think those are, those are real ones. So they're, I don't think those are going to affect, unless those documentaries are, I think the way we should be thinking about it, will this help me heavenward? With the things that I, listen to, with the things that I watch, with the things that I read, will it help my spiritual growth in Christ? So, you know, I think that's the best answer I can give you in regards to that. Thank if you. it's going to help, you know, then yes. But, you know, I also, oh, I'm sorry, I also like to watch like this fictitious um, uh, Christian movies and stuff like that. But the thing is, you know, it's better if you read the Bible. Because there's no fiction when it comes to the Bible. It's all true. And um, it took me, you know, it was really a struggle. And so, and I urge you guys to really seek God and, and have Him make that decision, help you make that decision. Yes? <coughs>
if you're developing communication or just like in AUP and mass communication yeah. students, you're required to watch these things, this kind of movie, so that you you have knowledge about that. So okay. how about that? Well, you know, that's a tough question. Um, first of all, before you watch it, pray that anything that will be, you know, harmful that you'll see there, that God will just eliminate. You know, the things that you need to watch, and you need it for your school, then of course... Uh, I think it's about, uh, it depends upon the motives of one person. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So the motives of uh, one person, if that's your motive is to watch TV because you have a project or that's your permit, right. that's so. Mm -hmm. If if your motive is just you want to entertain yourself, that's, that's deeper. Really, yeah, exactly. Maybe just, uh, it depends upon the motives. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, when your motive is sincere and true, God knows, you know, God knows your heart. Exactly. So. In music, yeah. how about the contemporary music? Nowadays in contemporary Christian, yeah. I know. Music. So we so um, have a, a very uh, music issue about contemporary music. I know. So how about what is your stand for that? Well, for me, okay, I always like think of you know anything that has gone to it. I try to learn it from. Actually, for me personally. Yeah. 
saying to them, to those people that I praise you, mm -hmm. I praise you because I am nothing. So you're telling them a story mm -hmm. when you're saying. So you're just acting like that because you're telling them mm -hmm. what in singing. You're just telling, but there's a note like that. So I think it depends that I guess in about intention, yeah. intention. But at the same time, we don't want the person that is watching us yes, to stumble. Right? Because they you know, as human we always tend to judge. And it's like, ugh, it's those that kind of nature that God really needs to work in our lives. Because yes, your intention is that, but at the same time some people are like, why is he overdoing it? Why is she why is she doing those moves? You know, and, and you're like want, wanting to know it's like, hmm, is that you know But if if you're sincere, God knows the sincerity of our hearts. And so um it, it really is a tough question and I, I let's pray that they will make a stand for it. We have other stands, you know, in other you know different 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 um we have stands on um, you know, women's motivation or whatnot, but we need to make a stand to it in regards to these did, did you have a question?
that you will remove the competitive, the, the pride, and, and the selfishness in our lives, that you will help us to have the character of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord, and shape us in his image, Father.